Hey! Hello to anyone who is there, who's able to join today. Uh, and again, let me move this around, get situated. Again, apologies for not being able to be with everyone as, as normal yesterday. Um, but if you are a uh, Wisecrack fan or listener or anything, you could, you could, I could prove to you the reason I couldn't do this. Because uh, I was on the Show Me the Meaning podcast yesterday talking about the movie being John Malkovich. It's a fun one. Um, but so here's what I'm going to do. I, don't, I assume a lot of people aren't going to be able to catch this live or some people might catch it later. And that's totally fine. Um, and I didn't even do what I normally do in terms of like posting about this right now. Oh, well. I'm um, going to move this camera a little bit. Cool. So I want to just – this will be a shorter one probably. But I want to keep talking about the book, keep a little momentum going here. So for, for anyone who's, I don't think this would be anyone, but if anyone is, just show me, what's up, dude abides? Um, and this really, this warms my heart. The highlight of your work night, that's really nice. You're the best. Um, and Burnsy it is, yes. Um, so dude abides, glad you're here. Hopefully you're off to a good work night. Hopefully deliveries are going well. Um, I know you're in Michigan, so I hope no one's trying to kidnap you. What a crazy story that people are trying to kidnap the governor, uh, governor of New Jersey. That's wild. Um, so I think this week has been an interesting week for me to think about this book, right? So just for some summary for anyone who's just diving in, if you're catching up on this after the fact, we're reading this book by Byung Chul Han called The Burnout Society. Um, it's a book that is trying to analyze a particular phenomenon taking place in our era, which is the phenomenon of burnout. Now, he connects sort of burnout to things like depression and hyperactivity disorder. But the main gist here is um, Han is arguing that the conditions of and I wish there was I think there is a better term, but I'll just be lazy that the conditions of late capitalism. Oh, that was a burp. I'm sorry. That's gross. But the conditions of late capitalism have led to a situation in which we are primed for burnout. Well, why are we primed for burnout? Because in a previous era, it was the case that like often the antagonisms that affected our life were external. So in terms of using, there's like a plane flying over, it doesn't bother anyone. Um, but in terms of like thinking about a medical situation, um, he wants to say that like, it used to be the case that all the stuff that affected us is coming from outside. While they pee, glad you're here, man. I'm once again so sorry for switching the time around. I'm glad some of you are still here. It means a lot. Um, so you know, he 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 gets into this this idea that like negativity used to be the thing that, for lack of a better term, fucked us up. So whether that be an actual fear of something or someone coming from outside or a disease coming from the outside. And we already talked about how it's ironic that he thinks that like we're past the age where viruses can hurt us when we're currently in an age where many of us might not have hugged our, our mothers or parents because of because of viruses. But I think the most important way this applies is, is like work and labor, right? So if we imagine how a lot of people worked not even that long ago, I, I think we can we know it's an era where you where you were more likely to like go to a physical place and participate in some sort of production in which you were sort of like oh, you were done when you were done. Right now, I know like a lot of service industry work, I feel like is in like a, in a middle space with that because you're putting a lot of extra emotional effort into your labor. But even if you're like a, a server or a dishwasher, you know, when you leave, you're done. Now, he's interested in a certain and, and this is just one part of it, but in the shift of labor that's happened by which we are responsible for our own labor, for our own productivity. I think this is, you know, very uh, appropriate to the current moment where lots of people are working from home. And a lot of people don't have jobs, so are freelancing or doing other types of work. And he's interested in the way in which we internalize this frenetic pace. And, and we know this too, right? That uh, a big thing he, he taps into in the, in the text is the kind of hyperactivity of our age. And, you know, I've said this before, but think about it. Like when I was, you know, reading and prepping just now for this, I had my TV on. I was watching Community, currently watching Community. Um, I occasionally looked at my phone. I had my laptop open and I was looking at, at the book. So, and that's like fucked up. I'm not saying that's good. I shouldn't do that. When I'm prepping in my perfect world, I would just read this book. 
but attention is going everywhere. And there's something about, I'll just use myself, my brain, in which I'm programmed to have this hyperactive sense of attention. I want to look at a bunch of different stuff. Um, so once, Oh, Carrie, the self-care fairy, shouts, glad you're here, excited that you're here. Um, due to buy, it says, no kidnapping plots, though been offered hits from joints on deliveries. So that's fun. I mean, I guess, like, you might not want to because you're driving, but that's still kind of fun. I feel like my camera's shaking. I don't know. I think it's going to touch you my table. Um, so once again, uh, I think an, an important theme from the book. Oh, no, I pointed the wrong way. From the book is this idea of hyperactivity, of, of sort of hyper attention. There's so many things that want our attention. So many things that want our attention. Obviously, due to buy a delivery driver. I know if you have to drive, of course you have to drive. But, you know, I guess you can, like, get get a little high and drive. Don't take any advice from me on that one. Um, and the last time we talked about, we ended on this chapter called Vita Activa. Now, something that he got into in the last two sections, what we talked about last week. And once again, if you're just diving into this, uh, the videos are always up for two weeks on Twitch. Twitch.tv slash Godzian Burn. Subscribe if you haven't. Um, and I'm also putting them on YouTube now. And... I'm not sure what my YouTube link is. I'm posting the videos on my Twitter, but you can watch these on YouTube now as well and go catch up that way. So if you go to YouTube, as always, feel free to subscribe. You can leave comments there. I'll look at them. But the good thing about YouTube is with Twitch, these things go away after two weeks. With YouTube, they'll just stay there. So I'm going to put all these up on YouTube um, so we can catch up, take things at our own pace. But uh, Carrie, the self-care fairy, we missed you all too. And we're just glad that you're here. Um, so... And just once again, if anyone's diving into this who's new to the channel, um, this is the Godsy and Burns Twitch stream. We do our Godsy and Burns comedy show, which we uh, didn't do last night because of me. And if I'm being very vulnerable with you all, it's because I was feeling that, the sort of burnout thing. I had a lot going on at work this week, and I felt kind of dead at the end of it, you know? Um, and so that's why we didn't have a show last week. But this is Philosophy Rips, our philosophy stream. Um, so one of the things that Han was talking about in the last sections of the book we talked about was the lack of time for contemplation, right? So like, what does it mean to live a life of contemplation? It means creating a life where you have time, I'll be crass, to think about shit, to really step back and think about shit, whether that's thinking about yourself, thinking about the world around you, thinking about questions, even the time to like watch a movie of a TV show play a game, whatever it might be, and think about the thing that you're consuming, to think about the media that you're participating in, right? So contemplation is important that way. And I did, we talked about this last time a little bit, that like for Aristotle, contemplation is really important and contemplation is tied to action because to act in a fulfilling way, we have to be able to think about what we're doing first. Now, what Han gets into is that in our sort of hyperactive attention uh, uh, attention requiring society we often make decisions quick without contemplating and we don't contemplate how we spend our time and we don't contemplate what we pay attention to and you know people talk a lot about the attention economy and and we know this that like people make money off our attention even like for example we're, we're using twitch right now twitch is a company owned by amazon we know that we know sometimes when we load a stream we have to watch um, uh, an ad or something like that. And of course we know that Twitch and Amazon are using this to collect data about us, but it would be the same if, if we used YouTube or anything like that. So it's kind of a necessary evil, but it's because our attention is valuable, right? That's why like Amazon has algorithms that want to learn how we spend our time, how we spend our attention. That's why our phones and tablets and stuff like that can even know how long we spend looking at stuff, where our eyes dart, all this sort of shit. So attention is now an economic factor, which is why sort of like it becomes this, it becomes like an act of rebellion in a certain respect by abstracting ourselves as much as we can from letting our attention be a commodity or commodified and instead taking it back as something that we use to contemplate and think about the world. So that's important. Let me catch up in the chat real quick. Well, that piece says I managed to go a few months without buying bud from tips oh yeah that's funny um delivering food meant you didn't have to buy bud not budweiser friends i think he means marijuana um oh and this is smart due to buy it says no hits covid concerns yes you don't want to get covid from someone you also don't want to get sick um time to write leaves of grass yeah 
And then uh, Jamie's here, B-Boy Effect. What's up, man? Hi. Uh, so glad that everyone's here. Once again, it means a lot that everyone's coming on on a Saturday. That's going to be a little shorter than usual. We'll kind of catch up next week. Like I said, I've been feeling the burnout this week, but I still wanted to, to be with you all this week. Um, so where we kind of ended, so last time right, we are talking about the importance of creating space for contemplation, how we live in a world that doesn't want us to contemplate. We live in a world, and if by world, I basically mean economic world, that wants our attention. Uh, wants us to be looking at stuff, consuming stuff all the time. Um, and I'll, I'll just say this too, this is kind of a digression, but I think like, because I'm a hippie enough, I maybe mean, not even a hippie enough, I'm, I'm a Greek enough to believe in philosophy as a way of life and philosophy as a sort of practice. I'm not going to say spiritual practice, but like a material practice. I think there could be something said for like a part of what it means to be reading this book right now, to be, I don't know, I guess doing some homework. And by homework, I mean stuff like this. I think we should all challenge ourselves to find space for contemplation. Whether that's, I mean, I know I take, I take walks a lot. And, but whenever I walk, I'm normally listening to a podcast or an audiobook or music. I've been thinking about this recently. Like I want to take some walks where I don't listen to anything, right? Where my attention is focused on where I am. Um, I want to make sure that when I'm reading, I sit my ass down and I read, not with like the TV or a movie on in the background or whatever. So I think that's an interesting thing this book does. It gives us ways to think about how we can reclaim our attention and reclaim space for contemplation. And, I, and I'm not trying to say that like, it makes us little Che Guevara's or something like that to do that. Um, but I'll say that like, it is an act of rebellion to take back your space of contemplation. Um, it is an act of rebellion to, to create space for your attention to be yours, right? It's hard to do, but you're fighting against that. Um, Wild AP says, the algorithms have started showing me mental health service ads. Oh boy. Um, Here's a dark story. Some of you might have heard me tell this before. I used to work for a company that no longer exists. Um, we had like a tech data analyst person and she was telling me and a coworker, um, I think, yeah, I think I mentioned this on the stream, but I'll just say it again. Um, but she was telling us how um, they can use data from like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram habits to predict when someone is depressed and considering suicide. And me and my other friend, who we were like a writer and a producer, more creative minded people. And I think being creative means you have to operate with a certain level of empathy. We were like, oh, my God, but that's so good that they could then reach out to that person or suggest mental health services. And she started laughing and was like, no, we use it to try to get them to buy bigger products because people at the end of their rope are more likely to make reckless purchases. And that's that's what we're fighting against. Right. We are fighting against forces that want to like predict our mental health states to make us buy shit. Um, Ryan says eye tracking and facial recognition are getting bonkers effective. Yeah, hundred percent. And once again, all of these things commodifying our attention, Canada. So it's legal and I'm a California. So it's legal. That's awesome. Uh, Carrie self care fairy says I associate leaves of grass with self contemplation. Yeah. And I think this is interesting, right? Navel gazing. We often use in a negative way. I think we need navel gazing more than ever right now, right? And I think that's something that, he doesn't say it, but Han gets into. So one of the last things in the section we finished on last week, and I might not get through talking about both next two chapters, and that's fine, so we'll get into it next week. This is kind of more of just like a, a catch-up sesh. Um, there's a line I loved. I read it last time. It's on page 19. Um, what does it say? Sorry. Um, dude, abide. Same with lawn care. Yeah. Like taking care of your lawn is great. Taking care of plants. All these things are reclaiming your time and your space to focus on new things. Um, <laughs> I'm down with navel gazing, but also fuck Thoreau. Carry the self-care fairy says. Yeah, I don't know a lot about Thoreau. Is he bad? Did he get can I don't know. Is he is he like a bad dude? I'm assuming he is because, you know, it's from a thing. Um, B-boy effect. Oh, thank you very much, Jamie. Appreciate that. Um, also, stay tuned because in a couple weeks, we're going we're gonna to have Jamie on the stream. I'm going to get some other folks. We're going to have a discussion about this. And before then, I'm going to ask you all to send in questions and thoughts. Um, but a line in this book that I just love, it's on page 19. And I think you'll have the page number, whether you know you have the physical book or a downloaded copy. And once again, if you haven't been here, if you haven't been participating, um, you can download the book. And before I get to this quote, Carry the self-care fairy brings up an important point. Happy mental health day. You know what? I'm going to stop for a second because we're talking about this book. A lot of what this book is doing is getting at the fact that we have structures in our society that are directly and negatively affecting our mental health. 
um, that are, and you know, Han talks about in the book things like ADHD, hyperactivity disorder, um, ooh, depression, all these sorts of things. Today's mental health day. I actually posted this online earlier. If anyone follows me on Twitter, if you've seen this, I'll just say, um, let's all be a part of normalizing mental health. And by that, I mean, letting it be normal for others in our lives to be dealing with things like depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, attention deficit disorder, whatever they're dealing with. And let's normalize that in ourselves as well, right? Um, so let's, you know, on, on both sides, let's make sure we are prioritizing our mental health, normalizing it. And I'll just say this, if this helps anyone, um, I'm someone that I've, I've been diagnosed with, with depression and anxiety. I take daily antidepressants and I was so afraid to do that for so many years. And it's been really helpful and really positive for me. And I do think it's not just that like we have to worry about our own mental health internal to what's going on with us. Remember what Han says in the book, right? It's shit that happens in the world has a direct effect on the functioning of our brain. And if we're gonna get a little psychoanalytic on the function of our unconscious. So it's hard. And I think it's harder than ever to not feel anxiety, to feel depression, to feel the sort of attention going every which way. And because it's Happy Mental National Mental Health Day, let's just be cognizant of that and remember that our mental health is just as important as our physical health. We just can't see it. And it's one of those things where if you're coughing, you don't feel awkward telling a friend you have a cough. But if you're depressed, you might just seem like everything's normal and you tell and no one can tell. But tell people that. Create space for that. And once again, I think that's why I like this book. It talks about something that's real. If we want to talk about philosophy, it's real. And we're going to keep doing it. Um, let's see. Okay. Yeah. And I think people are bringing this up. Um, okay. So yeah, I mentioned that story on the Social Dilemma episode. Thanks for reminding me of that one, Jamie. Um, Ryan has a question. Let's look at this and we'll, we'll get back to kind of talking about the book. Um, does it address the difference between thoughts and directed thinking, like going on a walk with a topic in mind to chew on versus letting thoughts slosh around in your brain? Um, I haven't gotten, and, 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 you know, Jamie, who's in here might know better than me. I haven't really noticed the distinction between that in the book. I think that like, there's something to be said and there's something in the Bartleby chapter that gets into this. I don't think the idea is that in contemplation that we just think nothing. It's that we have the space to contemplate things intentionally um but i think like and this is me not talking about han's book right now this is me talking about general stuff i think there's nothing more philosophical than you could do than go on a walk with a topic in mind like to go on a, on a walk with the intention of thinking through a problem there's a lot of philosophers in the history that have talked about this i mean two very obvious ones are emmanuel kant and soren kierkegaard who both used walking as a method of thinking but I also think there's something really important, and maybe this is a bit more phenomenological, to go on walks or have experiences in the world where you open yourself up to perceiving and thinking about things. Maybe when you normally go on walks, right, like you are listening to a podcast or you're on the phone, um, and because of that, you... Um, you know, you don't notice stuff going on around you, but maybe you go on a walk another time and you notice, this is gonna sound corny, but I mean this, like leaves and birds and the changing sky and you can immerse yourself in that. So I don't know, but we'll talk about this more, Ryan. I think really appreciate you you throwing out there. It's a really important point. Um, and then Carrie Selkirk Ferry says, Thoreau is just lame. True. Capitalism is a bitch show. True. Hey, MDD represent. I'm pretty sure that means major depressive disorder. I'm with you, bud. Um, yeah, and that's not to make fun of our mental health stuff. Just to be honest, some of us have it and we should be open with it. Now, finally, I'm getting to the line on page 19. Han says this, one exploits oneself. It means that exploitation is possible even without domination. Um, and even so, you know, people who suffer from depression, bipolar disorder, burnout syndrome, develop the symptoms displayed by the Musulmaner in concentration camps. And I'm not gonna go too far into that because it gets dark pretty quick. Um, but that idea of self-exploitation is really important, you know? And a lot of what the structure, we think about the structure of like certain anxiety disorders or attention disorders, it's our brain telling us we're not doing enough or we're, 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 we're doing this task wrong or the future, we might fuck up this or that or that. These are things that come internally, you know? It's like a, the call is coming from inside the house type stuff. And I think that's really, really, really important. Um, Let's see. Yeah, so we'll stop there. No, just uh, stop there talking about that quote real quick. Um, oh, that's funny. Um, 
Well, okay. Good stuff going on in the chat. I'm not going to put it all here, but I love it. Uh, talking about the throw stuff is very funny. Um, so the two chapters that I read for this week are the, the pedagogy of scene one and the Bartleby one. Um, now, I think the scene thing is important. It, it gets into that, that question of like, what do we pay attention to and how do we pay attention? And there's some good stuff from Nietzsche here. And I'm, I'm not really a Nietzsche expert. I've read enough Nietzsche to like teach Nietzsche. Um, but I'm not super intense there, but I thought this stuff is interesting. I kind of want to go look this up. I think, uh, most of the quotes here are from twilight of the idols and there's a line and this is, this is quoting Nietzsche. Um, well, it's yeah. Quoting Nietzsche on page 21 that says one must learn. And this is where the quote starts not to react immediately to stimulus, but instead to take control of the inhibiting, excluding instincts. I think this is important, right? We are facing stimulus all the time, whether it's ads, music, things we're looking at online, TV, games, our dog. Our dog doesn't count. Dogs are great. Pet your dog. Um, but we have to. We don't often think about how we respond to stimulus and what it means to learn to see. And you know, Nietzsche says this as well, quoted by Han. He says, "Learning to see means getting your eyes used to calm, to patience, to letting things come to you." This is back to Han, the end of the Nietzsche quote. He says, that is making yourself capable of deep and contemplative attention, casting a long and slow gaze. And I like that phrase a lot too, deep and contemplative attention, casting a long and slow gaze. So when we think about attention and when we think about the direction of our seeing, I think what he's getting at here is the difference between looking around like that because I'm responding to things like a hamster in the wheel and looking at everything the screen brings up and having 12 tabs open and all that sort of stuff and about being contemplative in what I'm looking at and why I'm looking at that and what I give my attention to. Um, and, and Jamie responded to Ryan in the comments here saying his philosophy is more about focusing our attention towards the world, being aware of being in the world, Dasein, Heidegger. Han would be less enthusiastic about merely having busy thoughts. Yes, without noticing of what it is around you. This is this sounds great. I appreciate Jamie saying this better than I could have. Um, but yeah, I think it's that idea. And this is what it's, he's getting into in, in this chapter essay, Pedagogy of Seeing, about thinking about how we see the world and not being passive, right? Not just being these little receptacles that let the world throw shit at us when we respond. We need to be active in our seeing. Active and how we are experiencing and perceiving the world. And that leads to an active sort of contemplation. Mm. Uh, and he says this, this is at the uh, bottom of page 21. He says, instead it offers resistance to crowding intrusive stimuli. Instead of surrendering the gaze to external impulses, it steers them in a sovereign fashion. If you do not think, if we do not think about our attention and what we're looking at, there are algorithms, companies, apps, everything that will gladly take it for you, right? There is there is no shortage of, of people and companies, whoever out there that want to take your attention. So we need to then consciously think about where we give it to and how we give it and to have a moment of reflection. And I think this is like, and I, I hope this isn't jumping around too much, but that's the philosophical move in general, right? Unexamined life is not worth living. What does that mean? It means when things happen, we examine them before we just run to them. So like maybe I do see an ad that seems interesting or maybe I'm compelled to watch another episode of something or whatever it might be and I have to ask myself, well, like why? Why am I compelled to look at this? Why does this thing want my attention? Whatever it might be. I'm going to move this light because it's getting kind of dark here. Oh, yeah, it's a little better. Um, so now it's a little, okay. So it's about taking that moment. I think a lot of like what, Han is describing here, and this isn't something I, I thought about before. I thought about it right now, so maybe this is a little off the cuff and reckless. I think a lot of this book gets into what does it mean to think philosophically in our age? What does it mean to be someone who is pursuing a life of philosophical contemplation in the era of hyper attention, in the era of you know consumption and production, in the era when we are supposed to be working constantly in the era of hustle culture and grind culture. You know, he's getting into that in a really cool way. Uh, Carrie says a lot of this is similar to the decolonization movement. Yeah, I'm not. I mean, I'm, I'm very familiar with like Franz Fanon and some of the work coming out of that tradition. But that does sound right. And I think a lot of that, too, is like, I mean, once again, the reason I think 
this would relate to decolonization is because it's sort of like a general philosophical attitude. Any, any, you know, whether it's like decolonization, feminism, Marxism, ecological thought, all of these things are about paying a level of attention to things that are happening that most people won't. Right. I mean, why do Marx and Engels end up with get with this great analysis of the conditions of the working class in England in the 19th century? Because they paid attention. And rather than just saying this is happening, it must be good. They stopped and asked questions. Right. Um, and, I, you know, this is something that happens a lot with politics. Like we grow up operating with a lot of assumptions and it's not until we stop and ask ourselves why that we can really learn. Um, long. Legs. Oh, sweet. Uh, while they peak. Getting down with Nietzsche. I love it. B-boy effect. Keyword is lingering. Yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. Um, so let's see. And then he draws this distinction in some page 22 between hyperactivity and hyperpassivity. I think this is important and shouts to dialectics. Um, he's already talked to us a lot about. Actually, I'm going to stop and just focus on Jamie's point. So the keyword is lingering, which is active, right? That means if we're lingering over something, like if I'm in the store and I am in the cereal aisle and I linger, it means that I'm paying attention to the different types of cereal. Maybe I'm even looking at like the health benefits or something like that as I actively think, not just like which box looks prettiest, but hmm, which cereal do I want? Which one might be healthiest? And then maybe I think like, hmm, which one will taste the best with which type of milk? And this is like a silly example because cereal, whatever, just eat whatever the fuck you want. But lingering implies an attentive state of not moving on to the next thing, not jumping around like that, lingering on a moment. The same way if you go on like a walk in nature and you see some cool leaves or trees or anything, you can stop and linger on those. Um, Dude Abide says, I got ADD. Hey, we're all just shouting out our mental health stuff here today. That's good. We're all together. We respect it. So I'm wondering how this would affect me. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that part of like, you know, Dude Abide's what he's getting into in the book is that, of course, a lot of these things, like people had ADD and, and you know, major depressive disorder before this era of hardcore media fueled capitalist consumption um, and production. But I think they're like, I think what he's getting at is we live in a society now that heightens those. Like no wonder mental health disorders are climbing at alarming rates because we live in a society and a culture that creates the conditions for those things to flourish. It's almost like if, you know, ADD or depression or anxiety were like little plants, we live in a culture that's watering them constantly that's helping them grow, that's like pouring fertilizer on them. It's fucked. So just to get back, I know I stopped to talk about uh, Jamie's really important point about lingering. Uh, um, so yeah, he brings up this point about hyperactivity versus hyperpassivity. Now, I think the mistake would be right to say, okay, Han is telling us that hyperactivity is bad. What's the opposite? Hyperpassivity. I just chill. I let the world pass me by. Maybe I ride around with dude abides and I accept the tokes that he can't get and I get real high and I'm just passive, right? He wants us. I realize it's silly that I, I play a stone person as I sit here in a tie-dye shirt. Sorry. Um, but he, he's he's getting to this point that like the the cure to a culture of hyperactivity is not hyperpassivity. It's not to let the world pass you by. It's not to not care, Right. You should care. You shouldn't care so much it makes you neurotic, but there should be a level of care. Um, and he has this line, and this is on 22. He says, it is, an is, it is an illusion to believe that being more active means being freer. I think that's important as well, that connection. Um, Carry the Self-Care Fairy says, yeah, fan on. If that's something we're interested in, this is real, because I'm thinking about what we're going to do after this. Maybe we should talk about fan on. And this is a weird aside. Before I left academia, I was working on a book about humanism that talked, it started with like Sartre and Althusser and de Beauvoir and got into Fanon and some like post-colonial stuff, um, looking at the role of the human. Maybe I can dig up some of that research, see if I still understand it. We can talk about Fanon because Fanon rules. Um, yeah, so along with this thing, and, and to get back to like the lingering point, he says this on page 22 as well. Today we live in a world that is very poor in interruption betweens and between times are lacking i love that between times are lacking and obviously for carrie between time is lacking because you're doing five other things i get it we all do it um so what does he mean by between time like think about how often we jump from thing to thing to thing to thing i used to love taking the bus or the train to work because it felt the sense of freedom like i didn't have to be productive 
right? I'm sitting on the train, I can read, I can do whatever, but I'm removed from the cycle of productivity that I normally feel like I'm in. So I think that between space is really important. So I think like, and I don't want to make this corny, but I think that's like a thing. I don't, I don't want to be like self helpy right? But that's the thing we could ask ourselves from this book. Like, where, where are we giving into patterns that erase betweens in our life? And where could we find some more betweens? I don't know. Now, I'll jump ahead a little bit. I thought the most, one of the most interesting things from the pedagogy of seeing chapter was this notion of rage. Now, I often think of rage as a, as bad. You know, you think about rage and sometimes I even think about the worst of contemporary politics and and people getting pissed and yelling and oh wow, this matches that. Let's put it there. Great. Um, you know, I don't even think about rage as a good thing. And he made me reconsider this. So he says, this is on the bottom of 22. He says, in contrast, rage puts the present as a whole into question. And he's drawing a distinction between anger, right? So what does it mean to be angry? I'm angry at one thing. And think about like politics, right? I might be like, oh, I don't like this presidential candidate. So I'm I'm angry um, at this one person. But I'm not questioning the system. Or I'm angry at, you know, where I live in California, we're getting a lot of fires. I can say I'm angry at these fires without questioning the system that creates those. So when he gets into rage, he's talking about an, an emotion that puts the present as a whole into question. So if I'm having like political rage, it's not just like, oh, this presidential candidate is dumb fuck or whatever it might be. It's more like, why is this system here in the first place? And I think like, I'll use this example. I don't, I assume this won't offend anyone. You know, the dumbest thing that, that people have done in America and, and the West in general, because it's a global problem, is to act as if like Donald Trump is an aberration or an anomaly rather than a direct outcome and feature of the system, right? It's not a mistake that Donald Trump became president. Everything in the system enabled that to happen because it worked perfectly. The system didn't dysfunction, right? So the question isn't like, how do we get Trump out? The question is, why do we have a system that created this in the first place? And that's where rage comes in, right? Anger is, I hate the orange-faced Cheeto president. Let's vote him out, which is fine. Rage is, why the fuck did this happen in the first place? What are the conditions that led to the creation of this like political momentum? And I think that's something he gets into here. And I love this phrase that comes next. I'm on the bottom of 22, if you're looking at your book or your PDF, whatever it might be, he says, and this is talking about rage. He says, it presupposes an interrupting pause in the present. God, I love that. An interrupting pause in the present. We'll get into this more later. Maybe even at the end of this, it makes me think of a law in Badju right here. I know Jamie pointed out last time that Badju um, wrote the intro to the translation of his book, I think, Agony and Eros. I still need to read that one. Um, Alain Badiou is one of my favorite living philosophers. But this idea of rage interrupting, pausing the present, right? Because what happens? We normally keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. And we never stop. And if we don't stop, we can't think. And that kind of gets back to what, oh, what's up, El Jave Torino? Uh, Torino, so glad that you're here. I'm excited. We love new people. We're all friends. Get involved in the chat. Um, hopefully this conversation makes sense. If not, you can catch up. There's a uh, old episodes of the series. Excited to have you here. I'll yeah, let's look at the chat for a second. Um, Ryan says a lot of this is why some drugs are great. I agree. They get people to socially engage like this, especially psychedelics. Never had a better walk while on LSD. Yeah. And I'll say this. And once again, this feels ridiculous to be the guy in the tie dye saying this. Um, I didn't, I didn't have any psychedelics till kind of later in life, but recently, like I took a hike and I had some mushrooms, relatively like low dose, and I found myself just like staring at things in nature, contemplating the beauty and the systems there. And, you know, in that moment of being on a psychedelic, I didn't care about like my phone or my Twitter feed or getting back to a TV. I was really caught up in the moment. Um, and while they piece says I miss mushroom hikes and I actually talked to, and this is maybe being a little TMI, but it's mental health day. So it's fine. I was talking to my therapist about, um, the important experiences I've had on psychedelics. And she said, the great thing about that is it can remind us that that type of existence is possible. Now, of course we can't always be on LSD. Don't do that. It'd be bad. But let's say if I'm on LSD and I, experience a new level of empathy and attention for the world around me. I know that that's a possible state and it's something I can aspire to 
in my my normal practice. And this is something that like to, to use the framework of someone like Alain Badiou, he'll talk about these events that happen. And when an event happens, it lets me know that a new thing is possible. So like, I don't know about you all, but the first time I ever went to like a big political protest, it was like, oh my God, this is like possible. A bunch of people diverse from all over getting together with some anger, maybe some rage about the same things. It creates this feeling of enthusiasm, like, oh my God, to use kind of the corny phrase, a different world is possible. And I think rage is getting us there. And, and I'm getting back to the book now and, and Hans, Hans terminology. See, you gotta, you gotta take notes, you gotta underline. Um, so once again, he says, rage puts the present as a whole into question. It presupposes an interrupting pause in the present. How often do we have the interrupting pause? Um, and he says, this is what distinguishes it from anger. The general distraction afflicting contemporary society does not allow the emphasis and energy of rage to arise. When he says this, that we don't, society doesn't allow rage to arise. I just think about how like, we can't ever get rage because we're pissed about something new every two days, right? Like one day, I don't know for me, like one day I'm pissed because my state is on fire and the next day I'm pissed because the air quality is horrible and no one's doing anything about it. And the next day I'm pissed because like there was a super spreader COVID event at the White House and no one cares. And the next day I'm pissed um, because you know, people are, corporations are running ads against uh, ballot propositions in California that would really help people. And I can't just stop and take that interrupting pause and focus, um, not to get too much into like, you know, theory and stuff like that, or, or politics or communism. But um, Lenin, who we probably think of as like a political figure, but Lenin also a, a, a philosophical thinker in his own right. You know, he wasn't like, trying to burn down society all at once. He like went to the mountains or woods and read Hegel's logic for a year because he knew that we have to contemplate before we change things. Um, Wild AP says, rage can be hot and in your face, but the slow burning variety is what I've got going on towards systems of power in place currently. Yeah. Um, and he says this, this is just brilliant. And this is where in my notes I wrote, it made me think of bad you. So I wrote that down. Where is that at? And that's, it says right there. Just so you know, I'm not a liar. Um, he says this plane flying overhead. Um, where is this? He says, rage is the capacity to interrupt a given state and make a new state begin. Right? Wow. This is great. Let's think about this again. Rage is the capacity to interrupt a given state and make a new state begin. So in rage, we can interrupt the moment and think about the possibility of something new. The rage could even be that like, I am, I catch myself staring at my fucking phone five hours a day and I'm pissed and I, I throw it across the room. I actually did this once. And that moment of, of rage enables me to step back. Mm. And sorry, I'm going to sip my water. Sorry. The moment of rage enables me to step back and say, well, what could a new state be? What could something different be? How can I move away from this? Um, and it doesn't mean itself we can always change. Like I could have rage about the system of contemporary American capitalism and I can't just stop that, but I can figure out places to channel that rage. So I think this, and this is important because he's, he's thinking about the relationship between time and attention here too, that sometimes interruption can be important, important to interrupt a given moment, to kind of think from outside of that moment and not take its assumptions for granted. Um, and he says, today it is yielding more and more to offense or annoyance. And I think that's important. Like, I think he's saying that we, we get offended or annoyed more than we get rage. And offense and annoyance, while not bad emotions in themselves, if I'm offended, it's normally just like, I'm offended at this person and I'm mad at this person. I don't like this person, but I'm not questioning the system. If I'm annoyed, I'm annoyed at this, this, this person or something someone said, I'm annoyed at this movie, but it's more of like this immediate kind of non-reflective reaction to something. Um, he also brings up having a beef, which I just love that he uses the phrase having a beef. Um, he says, you know, having a beef, which proves incapable of affecting de decisive change. And yeah, I feel like people don't often use sort of um, offense and annoyance to affect decisive change. I was actually reading a book that's not philosophical. I don't know if anyone knows these comedians, Jesus and Marrow. They're very funny. They have a podcast called Bodega Boys. They have a TV show as well. It's on Showtime. I don't have that network. They put most of it on YouTube. So if you've never seen Jesus and Mary, you can look them up. Um, but they wrote a book called God Level Knowledge Darts. And it's kind of like a comedy advice, whatever book. But there's a part in the book where they talk about how 
one of the downsides of like cancel culture is it leads to quickly attacking people that haven't had the same opportunities as other to like learn things. And one of the, one of the guys who wrote the book, Mero is like, yeah, I have friends that grew up in the Bronx and have been, you know, haven't had access to high levels of education that haven't yet learned all the like right wokest ways to talk about all these ideas. But if they say the wrong thing, they'll get canceled by who probably by someone that looks more like me, to be honest, like a, a middle class white person that's had access to all types of education. Um, so being like offended or annoyed and just like canceling someone in a certain sense isn't leading to effective affecting decisive change. That's not to say that like all cancellation is bad. It's good when we start canceling people for like rape and assault and changing culture in that way. That's a good thing just to make sure no one caught me slipping there. Um, so he says, annoyance relates to rage as fear relates to dread. This is important. Very Kierkegaardian too. Because like what is fear? Fear is I'm afraid of the meeting I have coming up with my boss. I'm afraid that my partner is going to leave me. I'm afraid that if I try a new skateboard trick, I'll break my ankle. What is dread? Um, and dread, you know, the, the, the word we, we'd have in like German for that is like angst, right? Dread is what is the point of my existence? What's going to happen? A am I going to die? When am I going to die? You know, it's something that applies to our, my, my being, my very existence. It's this kind of like Heideggerian, Kierkegaardian, Sartrean mood of, of an overwhelming dread about existence as such. And he's here saying that like anger is more like fear. I'm angry at a particular determinate thing. I fear a particular determinate thing. But in rage, I'm like raging at the system. I, I'm raging at what seems impossible to change. And in interrupting that, I can think about it. Um, whew, let's see. So I know I talked about rage a lot there. If anyone has thoughts, please share them. Um, but yeah, so that I thought that was was a really cool part in in that chapter. Let's check the chat for a second. I haven't looked down or haven't looked up for a little bit. Um, ooh, yeah. Um, Carry self care everything of Derrida in terms of the interruption, the pause in the moment, inspectors and marks. That's a really great point. Um, and I think, yeah, I think that's uh, that's just a, a good point. And inspectors and Mark, I haven't marks. I haven't looked at in a while. I'd love to go back to that. I used to love Derrida. And then I thought it was too cool for Derrida. And now I'm realizing Derrida is too cool for me. Um, El Jefe Torino says, I try to focus my anger to explain what really is the cause of it. Um, personality, the person, politics, corporations, manipulating our factors, control. I had to learn these skills through therapy and through philosophy. Yeah, that's really important, right? Because like what happens when we don't contemplate, we just lash out. So like the philosophical mood of contemplation and attention is like really useful. And in a sense too, World Mental Health Day, I'll say this again. I mean, what is more philosophical than taking time in therapy to stop and linger on my, feel my feelings and emotions and learn something about myself, right? Um, that, that's a philosophical thing to do. The process of therapy is kind of a Socratic interrogation of the unconscious of the emotions. So what's more philosophical? Um, and yeah, Duda Bride's TV show on Vice. Yes, the Dizamero TV show on Vice was great. Um, we got a Jamie drop. That's what I, whenever B-Boy FX says something, it's like, it's a Jamie drop. Got to check it out. In one of his other works, Han points out that the first word of Homer's Iliad is the Greek word for rage. So in a way, it's the beginning of the Western culture. That's really interesting. Um, and I think, too, like often the word rage as it gets used in political philosophy. There can be this liberal tendency towards like, let's say, reform over revolution. But but like the fact that revolution is fueled by rage doesn't often mean it's just like angry people that want to burn shit down. It's people that don't want to make things a little bit better. They want to fundamentally recreate the system. So if you you know read your history and read about like the French Revolution or the Haitian Revolution, of course there's rage involved in those things. Why? Because people don't just want the scraps from their masters. They want to fundamentally overturn a system. You know, and this is why politically even now people get mad. There's people that got, I got mad this week at the, the U.S. presidential debate. Once again, Donald Trump's horrible. No one should vote for him. If you vote in America, you should vote for Biden. Even if you don't love him, we should just fucking do it. But, you know, there's this thing where in the vice president debate between Pence and, and Harris, Harris kept bringing up that like, they're not against fracking. They're not against fracking. And it's like, well, this is why we get mad at this shit. Because even the good team is still like, let's do stuff that's objectively detrimental to the environment and will kill us one day. So rage is like, I don't want your little like piecemeal half this, half that. Let's fucking go and change things. Um, 
El Jefe says, annoyance is usually the basis of rage for myself. Yeah, and rage can turn inwards too. That's for real. Ryan says, I think part of this is that institutions are what rage is best used against, and institutions have become so embedded in our world that it's hard to focus on them beyond individuals. Yes, I think that's such a good point. It's easy to focus on individuals and get angry at them. It's hard to interrogate the system, and it's overwhelming. I almost think, like, in, to use Han's terms here, rage can lead to dread because I might get so enraged at a system. And this happens a lot when I go on uh, mental spirals when I think about climate change. I, I get so mad, and then I feel this dread because it's like I have no fucking power. What's going to happen? It's scary. Judge dread. I love it. Um, <laughs> I am the law. We did a video at Wisecrack recently on Judge Dredd, where I had to say I am the law. Um, I need a Judge Dredd sequel. Yeah. Um, okay, this is good. Um, got a lot of good movie discussion there. I like it. But if you like Judge Dredd, check out the recent Wisecrack video. Once again, that's my employer. This isn't, I'm not working for them right now. This is my thing. This is our thing. So we're already um, at 45 minutes. So let's do this. Um, let's start. I'm going to start next week. And next week, we'll be back on the normal time with the Bartleby case. We're going to start talking about that. For anyone that, that cares, too, um, I, I the Friday the 23rd, I think, of October, I'm not going to be here. So that will we'll take a week off. We'll maybe call it, like, catch-up week, um, where not catch-up like the condiment catch-up. Like, we can catch-up on stuff. So we can take some time to, like, read things we haven't read yet, watch some of the old videos. If anyone has any questions right now, feel free to drop them. If not, I'm going to start wrapping up. As always, if you're here for the first time, love you, appreciate you. Um, if you have questions for me, I'm getting better at responding to stuff. You can always hit me up on Twitter at Michael O. Burns. Um, emails Michael O'Neill Burns at Gmail. Um, there will be an archive of this on Twitch for two weeks. I'm going to upload it to YouTube as well as soon as I sign off here. Um, if you have not read this book yet or looked at it, there's easily available PDFs you can find. So just Google it and I guarantee you, you'll find one. And if, if you have questions, bring them and we can just talk about that next time. Um, thanks to everyone for being here. It's Saturday. You have any better things you could have done. And it means a lot. Um, and it's good to see some of you back. Carry Self Care Fairy. Haven't seen you here in a while. Great to see you. El Jefe Torino. I hope you come back. Ryan, good to see you. And of course, due to Bides, B-Boy Effect. Um, Wild AP, just the you're like the bar regulars. The if this was Cheers, you would be the ones that everyone knows, and that's why we're glad that you're here. So let's get into this. And I think too, like when you're reading this stuff, I think one of the most important things we can do is just think about like, and we should think this with all philosophy. We just think like, why the fuck does it matter? And I mean that in a good way. Let's think about why this matters. And like, let's say this for our homework too. Let's linger this week. I'm going to try to find some times to linger this week. I think it'll be helpful. Uh, Final Wild AP says, for anyone who wants to get into revolutions, you should go binge the Revolutions podcast by Mike Duncan. I haven't listened to all those, but I have some. And I want to listen to more now. So I'm going to do that. Um, but without any further ado, I'm going to sign off for the night. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I'll be back on Friday for sure. We'll at least talk about the Bartleby chapter and maybe the one after that. Um... But, you know, read as much as you want, read back, and I never, we can always go back and talk about other stuff in this book. Note that we'll do a couple more sessions on this, we'll take a break, and then we'll come do a full discussion where we have a few people on here, we get into themes of the book, and also, too, not a perfect book. No book is a perfect book. We're just kind of reading it, getting into it right now, we'll talk about some critical stuff later, too. Have an awesome week. Um, love and respect. Thank you so much for being here. Love you all, and I will see you next time. Later, everyone.